I am so pleased to welcome, he will be our youngest ever guest on What Manners Most by at least a decade or two or more. Uh, but I will tell you the wisdom you are about to hear from 17 year old Jalen Thompson, I think will really blow you away. And I'm absolutely thrilled he's in high demand for all the right reasons this month. Jalen Thompson, welcome to What Manners Most. Uh, thank you, I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. Jalen, you have gone in the span of a couple of weeks from being a high school senior, part of the class of 2020, thinking about perhaps a graduation that was going to be different for you as for young graduating students across the United States and around the world because of the global pandemic. Mm -hmm. And factor that out of the equation, suddenly have taken on a whole new role as a voice of your generation and a voice for young men and women of color around the globe. Tell us a little bit about the genesis of how this all, all came together, your, your march and, and the few days, because it came together just a couple of days, as I understand. Tell yeah. us a little bit about the genesis of it. Um, so basically, it was a Saturday night, the march. We planned it for the Monday that next week. So we were all kind of, of course, upset, heartbroken. We were just having trouble kind of figuring out what we wanted to do to kind of press the issue that has been brought back up by the George Floyd murder. And my friends and I, there were four of us, we were like, we should go to a protest or something. And what we actually ended up deciding on, it was one of my friends, Ryan Staples' idea. He was like, we should plan our own demonstration here in our city. So we were, of course, we were like, let's make sure it stays peaceful because that's a big thing right now is whether or not they're peaceful, whether or not they're, what's happening with the protests and what, what's the effective way to handle this. And so for ours specifically, we were like, in our community, we have a good relationship with the police. So we got them involved and had them block off the roads and make sure everyone was safe. And the police chief here actually marched with us. And so it was supposed to be about 300 people we were hoping to get because, you know, we're just high school students. So we didn't think that that many people were actually going to show up. And it was kind of just supposed to be us kind of talking our way through things, just kind of an outlet. And halfway through Sunday, I was actually at work. My Facebook post that I had put out there to kind of promote it was screenshotted and put on a traffic scanner page, like on Facebook. And that got like thousands of comments and people were talking about it. And a lot of those comments were negative. And that's why I personally think that a lot of people came to kind of show the support that they didn't see in those comments. Did it surprise you that there was even any kind of a remote negative reaction to what you planned as something that was very uplifting and positive? Um, as, sad as, as sad as it is to say, no, I was definitely, we were kind of waiting for someone to say something because there had been people that have talked about it and there always are that talk about this issue as if it's kind of a, a regional issue from city to city. And despite the fact that here in O'Fallon, we're not really on the forefront of seeing those issues with the police all the time, they're still there. And they're also still something that we as a community need to talk about so that other cities can have the same good relationship with whoever it is that's supposed to be protecting them. Tell us a little bit. So you're in a town called O'Fallon, Missouri. Uh, as I understand, it's a population just under 90,000, and you're five, 600 miles away from Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So what's, right next to St. Louis, yeah. Mm -hmm. what's, what, is, what's the, what would you say is the composition of O'Fallon? What's, what's a, a typical community like? What, what have, your, have you lived there all of your life? What are your, what are your feelings about the community in general? Um, so I've been here since I was three. We moved here right before my brother was born. And the community, the makeup of it at least, is 90% white about. And so for most of my life, of course, I've been surrounded by majority white people. And I've gone to mostly white schools. And here the topic of racism and Black Lives Matter is interestingly enough, kind of more touchy than it is in another place where you might actually be having people talking about it hands on. Because a lot of people here kind of don't want to see it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't think it's a problem here. And again, I'm 
thankful for the opportunities that I have and that I've had because we live here. The school system that I go to is much better than certain school systems in other cities. And I think that's something that especially resonates with me is that I've seen what I think a school system should be like or what, what people should be treated like. And that's not the case everywhere. So for me, it's helped me to kind of look around and see that there does need to be change. There needs to be change in multiple different places because there are cities like this. So we know we can have that, which is why we need to put forth as much effort as possible to change it in other places. Jalen, where do you think that disconnect is? So you're holding up your community as perhaps not a perfect example of where we could be, but certainly uh, a community where people of different races, even though it's largely white as you've described, can live together in, in harmony and tranquility with a police force that's respectful. What do you think is different and, and what can be exported from that model that you have there in O'Fallon, particularly to communities that are even more diverse where there are greater problems? What's, what are some things that you think those communities where the issues exist, what are some of the things you think they might do? Um, so, especially with different communities like St. Louis, Ferguson, they're right down the road. It's kind of a big issue with just the communities themselves and how they're set up. I'm kind of big right now on talking about property taxes and how our school system works because they're setting different kids up and different people in the community up for failure, basically. There are different places in this country where kids don't have the same hope for the future as I do because they're just not given that kind of hope. They don't see that because they aren't given those opportunities. They're not given those chances. So for any community like this, the kids are likely to be more respectful. They're likely to not get into trouble as much. It's just because we have so many other things to be doing. We're full of, their, my school is full of extracurricular activities because we have the money for it. We're full of different things that we can do. And something that I think as a country we need to focus more on is just the fact that there are different school systems that don't have that ability. So it kind of is like a big circle of police treating people incorrectly in certain areas and those kids not seeing hope and those kids acting out or adults acting out because they're trying to find literally any way to give their kids a life, whether that be by working every day or even illegal means. Like that's why some of that stuff exists is because it's built into our country. Now you said something before that I find so interesting and so humble on your part. You said we're just high school kids, right? Just high school students. And when I look at the developments, when we've seen real change happen over the past couple of years in particular. So we look at the high school shooting in Florida. We look at the environmental progress that's been made because of young, very even younger than you, mm -hmm. advocates speaking out against the issues of climate change. What do you think, what role do you think that high school students can play? And what was it about this particular point in time? There have been other incidents, of course, there have been other shootings. What was for you what was different for you and your friends that said, you know what, we've got to do something, we can make a difference. You never imagined it would be what it's turned into, but what do you think that spark was for you? For me personally, this time, it's just because this issue kind of affects me, of course, as a young black man, more so than other people. It is very, very frightening to me that I'm, I just graduated, I'm leaving for college in two months, and someday that could be me. And I've said it time and time again, and it doesn't, it doesn't get any easier to say that someday that could, be, that could happen to me. And that's something that shouldn't have to be a fear in my mind. It shouldn't have to be a fear in my parents' mind that that is something, that's a reality here. That I could act ever so slightly wrong or too black or something like that, and I could, my life could end. That's a, that's a huge motivating factor, I can imagine. And you said there were, was it three or four of you that were kind of the organizers for the march? Yeah. What, so we, you talked about how you got this tremendous response that you never imagined. You thought maybe you were going to have a few hundred. It turned into a couple of thousand. Tell us a little bit about that day uh, as, you were, as you were standing there. What, what time did the march start? And 
and how did how far did you walk and how did the day unfold so earlier in the day actually we had a meeting with the police and they kind of just talked to us about what the plan was where we were going to march to all that stuff and so we got there at six it was supposed to start at seven so we got there early so that we could kind of meet people and talk to people and thank them for coming out and so from six to six thirty we kind of talked to everyone there and then from six thirty to six forty five it was like oh there are too many people showing up we can't talk to everyone this is getting this is getting pretty big now so for those next 15 minutes we were like i guess we should probably just start getting people ready to go and so the chief of police talked and then the we got ready and we started marching and we marched from our my high school to the police station which is just down the road if you turn right and like walk down the street and so we marched down the street i i want to say it's at the most a mile and we went down we stopped in front of the police station we the four of us all said some stuff we all talked we all spoke and then we marched back and it went so well because there were people talking about it being assuming that it was going to turn out poorly because as you can see a lot of people have the misconception now that all of these protests are turning violent even though the majority of them aren't yes so you it, it turned out more beautifully both in terms of the numbers you showed up but in terms of the way the day progressed and the response you got what was what was happening on the sidelines as you were marching were people streaming in and joining you were people cheering you on what was what was happening during the march from those who were not marching um you did have people that were sitting on the side talking and watching and that was something that was cool to me that even if you didn't participate just the fact that you showed up to watch means that you're interested in the conversation you're taking you're taking it in thinking about it and as we as we marched sure enough more people got there as the hour that we had set up to plan for the march went on and that was just kind of exciting to me that there were that many people like I could turn around at the end of the street and I couldn't see the end of the sea of people that that many people in the town like this where oftentimes it's said that we shouldn't be having this conversation would show up for something like this could we talk a little bit about your um, about your family background and also about your schooling you are so you come across so well grounded and so thoughtful and mature beyond your years to what do you owe that poise and the eloquence that you have and the passion that you have for this issue and i'm sure many others as well where does where does that come from um i think more than anything i my parents have always been very very even when it's to my dismay nice and polite to everyone that they've come across and they always talk to me about being polite whenever you can and talking to everyone and just kind of carrying yourself in a manner that's going to get you far in life and between them and actually my music my music passion is that kind of made me more confident it's given me the ability to stand in front of a bunch of people and do whatever it is that I'm doing speaking of course is a new thing for me to do in front of people but it's it's been very, very helpful for me just to have my parents who, again, brought me here just so that I could have a, a better chance at doing what I wanted to do in life. And two, music that kind of drives me. Did you, in terms of role models, did you have either from your parents or other family members, family friends, an example of those who perhaps marched against the injustices that we've seen in previous generations so from the 60s or the 70s and, and beyond any any role models that you could look to in that sense um so actually this is a story that i was told after the march happened my my nana she'll get mad at me if i called her anything other than that <laughs> um, she told me that when she was younger they actually um snuck out to go to a march and they like handed out flyers and stuff like that and helped out in whatever way they could. And just the fact that that story kind of resonates with me again, because I didn't tell my parents about this beforehand because again, it wasn't supposed to be a big deal, but it's just the fact that there are young people in my generation and even past generations that care about the country so much and about these issues so much that they would do things like that and get in trouble or, 
risk being told not to do certain things. It's wonderful to me that they would, and that kids are doing it still now, would go through so much just to make sure that their future is still intact. I find that so inspiring. And of course, you know, this podcast, it's called What Matters Most. And the fact that your parents really instilled in you the importance of that kindness and consideration and politeness. And something I always do advocate for, though, is that just because you have good manners does not mean that people get to treat you like a doormat. So it's important to stand up for things that matter to you. It's important when you see injustice happening that you say something and don't just sit on the sidelines. And you've, you've done that. I, I feel like you've struck this wonderful balance where it's, it, what you're doing is so unassailable. You are, you're speaking out on a, an essential issue. You're doing it in a smart way. You're getting, you're getting multiple communities on board. You're speaking with the authorities and, and you're making a difference. And now can you talk about the reaction that has happened ever since the march, all the media that you've done, some of the shows, the interviews that you've done in the intervening weeks? So, uh, yeah, I guess the day after the march, we went to the police station. We actually brought pizza for the police officers to thank them because, again, they've been so gracious to us and helpful with everything that's happened. And when we we were leaving the police station and I got a call on my phone, it was from like a band director that I have, I just finished a thing with. And he was like, you need to check your email. I sent you an email from someone. They want to get in contact with you. And I was like, oh, okay. So I called the number from what I was like, I don't know if this is real or whatever, but I called it and they were like, hi, this is a producer from the Today Show. And I was like, oh, hi. And of course I was freaking out and my friends were freaking out. And I was like, this is just the fact that it's so quickly kind of just kicked off. And I was one so happy that it was getting that kind of attention in the first place that something that we had put together was kind of resonating with that many people all of a sudden and two that not necessarily for myself but just for the sake of others that I know need to start having this conversation that I can kind of put my voice out there and help to spread the message that we're trying to spread. So you've you've been on the Today Show and that was a marvelous experience. I know I mentioned I saw you on Lawrence O'Donnell's show, The Last Word. And I was, interestingly, I thought, okay, I need to contact Jalen. I don't know how to contact him, but I'm guessing Twitter. So I went over to Twitter and, and I don't know if you have had this experience, but I was watching your Twitter follower count while you were on that broadcast in real time. And it was like a churning casino machine as the numbers were going up and up and up as people nationwide and around the globe were, were watching your remarks. Um, what, what has the social media engagement been like for you? I'm, I'm hoping it's been mostly positive. Um, how has, how has it been for, uh, you know, an otherwise beforehand, uh, an anonymous teenager from Missouri suddenly becoming, uh, a visible spokesperson for change and a symbol of the positive power of change and, and the wonderful message. What has that been like for you and what has it been like on social media? So, of course, thankfully, it's been, it's definitely been overwhelmingly positive. People have been so, so nice to me about it and told me so many things that, that this is helping them to understand that this is, that they're looking to me as an inspiration. And it's overwhelming, to say the least, but I could not be more thankful for gaining such a platform. Like you said, it was, it was very, very fast. When I got done with the interview, my dad looked over at me, he was sitting on the couch and he was like, uh, you have 2,000 followers on Twitter. And before the interview, of course, I had like 400 just friends that followed me on Twitter. And I was like, oh, oh, wow. So it's it's been especially, I feel privileged to be able to have that kind of platform all of a sudden for people to be able to see my tweets and see what I'm talking about and be engaged and have someone, especially locally for people around here, there isn't really there often isn't someone that they can look to for guidance on it. And whether I can help them find guidance from someone else who's more educated than myself, because I'm definitely still learning things from someone else or that I can help them to understand this issue so that we can all work together and overcome it is, it's just a blessing. 
how do you take this platform that you've built again you weren't you weren't planning on it necessarily becoming what it has become how do you take this and build out from it how do you have you had any social media interactions where people are interested in in partnering with you and your friends on ways to expand and, and grow this movement especially for people who are your your age just graduating from high school um, what have you what have you had in and give us a, a window into what we might be seeing in the coming weeks and months uh, based on some of the engagements you've had because of this new platform. Um, so basically, I, I definitely have had people reach out to me. I've helped out with a few of the other protests that have been planned in this area now that we've kind of started the conversation. But for me, and I've said this before, it's, it's a long game. This is going to be a very long hard battle to fight as far as getting these kinds of reforms or changing things that we need changed or seeing especially the societal change to everything that's happening here. And to me, it's important that we take our time. Burnout is definitely a thing for people and young activists. My friends have re reminded me of that time and time again. They're like, take a break if you need to. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't do this and don't do this too much. And I'm making sure that I take a step back every once in a while and plan and strategize accordingly because this is going to be something that we're going to have to talk about for a long time. I'm going to be voting in November. I'll be 18 in August. That's a big step is to start voting at every chance that we have so that our voices can be heard. It's important to me that we start celebrating things like Juneteenth is coming up. That's something that isn't really on a lot of people's radars. I know a lot of people don't really know that Juneteenth even exists, but it's something that we should all be talking about because it's, it's pushing conversation forward for one, to educate everyone on black history like it's history history because it is, and two, just to kind of start acknowledging things more often. February is Black History Month, but hopefully we don't need Black History Month sooner rather than later because it should be worked into everyday education. Jalen, since you've brought up Juneteenth, would you care to share with the listeners a little bit of, of what you've learned, perhaps even recently, or what you knew of Juneteenth prior? So basically, Juneteenth is kind of like a, in, in a short way to explain it, it's like a celebration of freedom for African American people. Because back when the Civil War was happening and the final, the Emancipation Proclamation freed half of the slaves. And at the end of the Civil War, all of the slaves were freed finally. And that's kind of what it's celebrating is that they were free. But again, there's so much more to go in this fight for equality. And that's, to me, what a, a lot of Juneteenth is about is kind of recognizing the, the fight for freedom, just the African American people. And June 19th, of course, is the day that that happened. So it's just a fitting kind of 4th of July-esque event where it's kind of a celebration of freedom, but it's more focused towards recognizing that there's still a ways to go. It's not all positive things that we have here. It's kind of saying we're all in this together, watching this grow and watching this issue and all of these things kind of fit together. You, you mentioned that this is a long game and that change doesn't happen overnight. I know for a lot of people, and I would be one of them, the change hasn't happened fast enough. When you think about all the different movements that have happened throughout the 20th century and then into the 21st century, you, you wonder you know, how many people must be um, uh, killed and how many people must endure the, the oppression before there's true change. We certainly have seen from Congress uh, this week, from the entertainment industry this week, uh, some, some serious movement towards change, at least the desire to make some change. What are your feelings about some of the changes that seem to be in the wings that this movement has helped foster? I think I'm definitely excited just to see how it goes. Like, again, Minneapolis saying that they're going to kind of dissolve their police system as it is and work towards a new different kind of less all-encompassing uh, public protection system. I think that I'm excited to see how that goes because if it works, then other cities can follow suit. Other places can kind of commit to that same level of change because the, the, the bottom line is that what we have right now isn't working for certain people. 
it may work for people in communities like mine, but it doesn't work for people in inner cities. It doesn't work for people who look like me that live in those cities and that needs to change. So for me, I'm, I'm big on listening to at least not necessarily always agreeing with, but listen to the, listen to the debates about defunding the police because the fact that we put so much money into our police system and not our education system comparatively is worrisome to me. It's, it's important to me that those things need to be kind of balanced, just like our government system is supposed to be. There's supposed to be checks and balances. And right now I think that those are and have been for a long time out of whack. They're not working the way that they need to be. So something needs to change. And I think moderate changes at first are acceptable. People are kind of worried right now that like the democratic reform bill that they are proposing. Some people are saying it's not enough. Some people are saying it needs to be more. But for me personally, I think kind of just accepting whatever they're willing to give us at first, seeing how it goes, and then voicing our opinions again is a better chance. Any change right now is a small win in our long, long fight towards getting things done. I guess the message there is better incremental change rather than getting nothing at all get the incremental change and then immediately start working on the next set of changes and, and build from there. Mm -hmm, definitely. Now you seem to have, and I don't know anything about what you were studying in high school other than obviously the, the essentials that all high school students study. You seem to have a real keen interest in civics and history. I'm wondering, is, is that, are those passions of yours and what do you hope to be studying when you go off to college? Um, so for me personally, I think my kind of interest at least, which usually I wouldn't call it an interest in civics or politics or anything. I'm usually, I usually like to stay on top of it, but not necessarily because I love it so much, just because I think it's something everyone should do. They kind of come from my government teacher who, as far as I'm aware, is the only black teacher in my school that I've learned from. It's the only black teacher I've ever had going from first grade all the way up to my senior year. And he taught us that to be able to change certain things or to be able to kind of do any of this, you have to, you have to know what you're talking about. You have to stay on top of things because there's a lot of discourse in our country right now, especially over the last four years. And kind of knowing what you're talking about and researching and educating yourself on all types of things is the best way for any of us to kind of just stop arguing so much and start to work towards change and work towards getting progress made. So when you go off to college, and, and I don't know if you know yet whether you'll actually be there in person at, in the fall semester, I know so many college students, really that's still up in the air, whether they'll actually be on campus or studying virtually. But do you have any thoughts about what you might like to major in? And has any of that changed as a result of this experience? So I was planning and I'm still planning on majoring in music education when I go off to college. And my thoughts on that have always been that if I can kind of incite the same type of change in kids that my directors and my teachers have given to me through just kind of being there and giving them in that outlet that music has given me, that I can make a change in the world. But because of all of this happening, I've definitely, I'm right now I'm looking at different minors. I'm not sure what exactly I might take. I think I'm thinking a pol political science minor, but we'll see because I definitely am absolutely going to stay invested and active in this social justice fight that we find ourselves in. Yeah, Jalen, you're, this is so important. I want to include it. Your signal was breaking up just a little bit when you were talking about your major and minor. Would you mind just giving that answer one more time? Absolutely. Um, so I'll be majoring in music education. I, that was the plan before, and, and that's not going to change only because I think if I'm able to incite the same kind of passion for something that my directors and my teachers have incited in me, I'll be able to kind of help those kids to look for future, look for change and look for, look ahead to hope. And for me, I think I'm considering having a minor, I'm probably going to take a minor in either political science or journalism of some sort. I'm not sure yet, but we'll see just because I'm definitely going to stay active and 
be in the fight for social justice like we have started already. You're, you're not, we're not letting you get away that easy, right? You're, you're going to be out there. I have a feeling hopefully inspiring others and continuing to use your voice for good as, as you've done uh, this past month. Are you planning on going to any marches this summer? Um, I am definitely going to go to some. I'm not sure when I'll get to get back out there. I was hoping to go in the last week or so because there have been so many more in my area now. But because of interviews and work, I haven't, I haven't gotten to go back to one since then. So I'm still, at, I'm still at one, but hopefully I will definitely be out there and fighting for whatever change I can get. You, you are so passionate as you've shared about music. I don't know what instrument you play. I'm a percussionist, so like marimba and snare and all stuff like that. Excellent. What do you think it is about the power of music to bring us together? How can music play a role? Um, for me personally, I think it's kind of just a matter of passion. It's something that for a long time for me has been helpful in keeping me grounded, keeping me happy. When I'm in a tough spot, I play music. When I'm in a tough situation, I listen to music. And there are also so many people who through music have kind of found their community and their audience and use that audience to kind of speak to change, to not only be musicians, but also be activists and be active in the fight for change and justice. And that's something that has always resonated with me is because we don't have to have, our passions don't always have to correlate perfectly. You just bringing things full circle back to that march. I want to think about two types of people that you'd potentially like to reach. Number one, I'd like you to think about how do you reach and what would you say to that individual who's on the absolute opposite end of this and who finds all these demonstrations upsetting and they find the demonstrations themselves racist, they don't like the, the slogan Black Lives Matter. How do you, how do you reach that individual and, and help change their mind and, and bring them around a little bit? That's, that's the first individual. And then I've got a second person I wanna see how you would reach that person. Um, for me personally, because I've had multiple conversations with people who feel that way recently, it's not always easy to do it in a one conversation kind of thing. I've had people kind of say, maybe I see where you're coming from now a little bit more. I think it's important for those people talking to them to educate yourself on how the other side feels. And it's okay to not necessarily see everything the same way that I see it, but I need those people to understand that none of us are like making this up. No one is, no one is going against you. It's a matter of how we feel. Where there are people in this country that have for a long, long time felt unprotected, unsafe, and they, they just aren't comfortable in their own skin. That's how, that's the best way to explain it is that they don't feel comfortable in certain places or even anywhere in their own skin. And that, that kind of feeling is something that no one should ever have to deal with. So at the very least, I would like those people to try and understand that that pain is something that we carry around with us. And that's why we're having this conversation because we would rather, we definitely would rather not have to. Do you think this is a conversation that your own children or their children will be having? Will that conversation be different? I think in certain ways, at least my children will have to, I, I definitely think we'll have to have that conversation. Hopefully it'll be a slightly different conversation, at least. Like years and years ago, it was definitely worse than it is now. I'm not, my parents aren't telling me not to go talk to the white boys at school because we're not, we're together. We can talk to them. It's not like that. So definitely I think the conversation is slowly but surely changing. So hopefully when I have my kids, they, they will have a different conversation. It will be slightly better and slightly closer to the conversation that hopefully one day won't exist. And for someone who looks like you, but doesn't feel the way you do, who feels hopeless, who feels this is never going to change and they feel like they just can't possibly do anything to change the system. What advice would you give to them? 
for those people, I would say that I, I understand that feeling of hopelessness, of kind of looking at everything as, as it is now and seeing that it's been this way for a long time. So it's, it's, it's a hard system, of course, to dismantle because we've been talking about it in our communities forever, in the Black community, in Black Lives Matter has been a thing. We've, since 2014, we've seen a more prevalent Black Lives Matter conversation, and we still haven't seen much change. So for those people, I just need them to understand that that feeling of hopelessness is completely a product of what we're talking about. It's not a product of them. It's not because they, they feel a certain way about themselves truly. That hopelessness comes directly from the system that we're trying to change. And now that there's a new, there's a new kind of feeling about this conversation where the protests aren't black people protesting for their rights. There are so many other people out there now. There are these protests, if you just, they look different. There are so many white people and so many different people from different walks of life out there fighting and hoping and trying to get this change to happen for the black community. And that is something that I think is most important is that if you felt hopeless before, I think it was because no one was listening. There were people that were ignoring it. Now, if you feel hopeless, it's from that same thing, but it's starting to change. There are people who were the ones ignoring you that are giving us attention. They're noticing it and they're seeing that something has to change. And I think that image of you, which is such a powerful image, but the image of you walking arm in arm with the local police chief is such powerful resonant proof of that point that you're just making. How did that moment arise? Was that just something that was completely spontaneous? Did it surprise you? Did it surprise you that it got the attention it did? Um, so the day of actually he talked to us, he was like, we'll see what, how things go. Because of course there was so much negativity going into that night that he was like, if, if the feeling is right, if the people aren't kind of, getting rowdy if everything is going as we want it to go i might even march with you guys because we want it to be clear that we understand and we support your cause we see what you're coming from we see where you're saying and we agree that no one should ever be treated the way that derek chauvin treated george floyd so it wasn't necessarily completely spontaneous but i definitely was surprised with the level of attention that it got it was, a, it was a beautiful moment. And I think, again, I think when I, when I consider all of the images that this, this sea change that we're going through right now are encapsulized in, I think that one is, is definitely gonna to be towards the top of the list for sure. Jalen, my last question for you. So you're 17, you are a part of, you're not a millennial, you're, you're Generation Z. So when you think about Generation Z, what is it do you hope and believe that your generation can do differently to bring about that change, different than even the millennials and the generations before them? I think for the most part, so far at least, we've been raised in a different climate than any generation before us. We are, we're seeing more gay pride, more LGBTQ support more african-american and white kind of coming together right now what we're seeing right now is special that's not usually as as bold as it is there are people that are talking about things that don't usually talk about those things and i think in the next coming years hopefully this is what i'm hoping happens we are more involved in po politics in the political climate not necessarily like day in and day out, just like, whoo, whoo, but vote, just go out and vote when we can. Just kind of, as you've seen before, we're definitely more, um, I wouldn't say like flip floppy, but we tend to formulate our opinions between millennials and us off more situational information. We vote one way or the other, whether that be Republican or Democrat more often, depending just on who we think is the best candidate. And I think that's something important is we are more accepting of change than I think any generation before us. If next year I vote for a Democrat and the year after I wanna vote for a Republican, that won't bother me 
and that doesn't bother as many of us as it would other generations. It sounds to me like part of what you're saying is that you feel as a member of Generation Z, which I guess is a, a label in itself, but that you don't feel like you need to be restricted by a particular label, that you can think independently, act independently based on whatever the situation might present. Yeah, definitely. We're very, very open-minded and quick to kind of decide things from what we see, not necessarily how we already feel. Yes. Well, Jalen, I want to thank you for taking the time. Again, I know you are in high demand for media interviews, and not to mention the fact that you've got a summer job and, and college to be thinking about and responsibilities at home. But I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, and I know that my listeners, when they hear your words, which are so eloquent and so powerful, I really feel like you can be an essential change agent at this time, and all the while practicing such wonderful manners, which is, is as important to me also. So congratulations on all of that and, and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be doing it all right now. It's absolutely wonderful. So thank you for having me. For Jalen, for those who I mentioned your Twitter feed, for those who want to follow you, follow your work, um, be further inspired by you, what are the best ways for them to connect with you and to follow you? Um, my Twitter is definitely the best way. We'll keep that the main area. Um, my Twitter is Jalen underscore is underscore me. And Jalen is spelled J-A-L-E-N. Super. And I'll put that in the show notes for the podcast as well uh, so that anybody didn't catch that, you'll be able to just copy paste that and you can make sure you follow Jalen whose who's insights on Twitter are just as insightful and impactful as they are in a conversation such as this. So Jalen, thank you again. Of course. Thank you very much.